Hello, Singapore. That was good. We can do better. Hi, Singapore. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was a little bit worried about this time slot because I know um, the only thing standing between me and your Friday hug from Aaron is this like 30-minute talk. But then I started thinking about the fact that the only thing standing between you and your um, beer or preferred evening beverage is Aaron's talk, and then I felt better. So. <laughs> Get that out of the way. Um, hello, my name is Vaidehi. Um, and just to get a show of hands in the room, how many of you grew up um, either reading or listening to fairy tales? Okay, it's a good number. Me too. Um, how many of you are familiar with the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Okay, sizable number. For those of you who, don't, who might not be familiar with the story, uh, to summarize, basically there's this uh, girl named Goldilocks and she uh, breaks into a house and the house is um, the home of three bears and she basically like, goes through all of their stuff, which seems like a terrible thing to teach children because like, if you're going to break into anyone's house, it should probably be like, you know, puppies or bunny rabbits. I don't think bears are the most friendly animals to do that to. But that aside, um, she basically uh, goes through all of their things and she like has the mama bear's porridge and the papa bear's porridge and one is too hot and one is too cold and the entire story is her trying to find the thing that is just right. So uh, I got to thinking about what Goldilocks's story might be like if it was reimagined and if we were to do a modern day retelling of it. So, surprise, it's story time. We're gonna do a modern day retelling of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. However, in our modern day retelling, Goldilocks is over, you know, breaking into large furry animals' houses. Um, instead, she is a Ruby developer. <laughs> because of course she is. <laughs> Um, so, Goldilocks is at her very first dev job ever, and she is getting to build code, and she's getting paid for it, and she's like, oh my god, this is amazing, I'm learning so much. And she's working at a small consultancy, um, and she basically has at her disposal all of these engineers that she can ask her questions to. And she's like, this is great, amazing, I'm going to learn a lot. And she does learn a lot, and she has a lot of fun. Um, but after a few months, she's definitely building things and she's contributing to projects, um, but she's not really sure if she's getting any better at programming. Is she writing better Ruby code? She doesn't know. Um, and she starts talking to other developers and she realizes that at her company, she doesn't really get any written feedback. Um, and part of the reason for this is that she doesn't really get real code reviews. Her team is really small, and if she wants code review, she has to ask for it, and she has to sit down with another engineer and tell them, hey, can you look at my code, and can you tell me what could be better and what, what I'm doing well? And she finds this a little, a little frustrating because she knows that other companies do have a bit more formalized code review processes. So after about a year there, she decides that this company is not the best fit for her anymore, uh, so she goes to another company, hoping that she'll find what she's looking for there. At her second dev job, things are very different. Everyone is code reviewed, and she even gets to code review. In fact, at her second week on the job, she reviews the CTO's code. And she's just like, what, me, really? I can have technical opinions? It turns out she can, um, and she's really excited about that. But even at the small startup that she's at, there are some limitations. So one of the limitations is that there's not very many people. And so as long as one person reviews uh, a pull request, it gets merged in. And this tends to be fine. Um, and code gets merged in. <laughs> Keeps getting merged in. Lots of pull requests. Um, but there are some drawbacks. Um, one of the things that she notices is that her team will sometimes create pull, 
pull requests, um, and they'll devolve into um, long comment threads. Um, and sometimes people will be like, we should use tabs. No, we should use spaces. We should use hash rockets. Why are we talking about this? And it'll just keep going. And um, they're not always the most fruitful conversations. Um, but things are fine. Uh, code keeps getting merged in, and things are getting shipped and deployed. And it seems to be working fine until one day. So Goldilocks has been working on this feature for about two weeks. And she has poured her heart and soul into it. And finally, she submits a pull request. And two engineers give it a thumbs up. And it gets merged in. And she's like, you know what? OK, I'm going to go for coffee. I'll see you kids later. She comes back 20 minutes later to find that the entire engineering team is freaking out. Uh, and there's a fire. And the fire is that the entire staging environment has just like gone down in flames. And they're like, Goldilocks, what did you do? You just merged this giant feature in. You did something. And she's like, well, you reviewed my code. Both of you reviewed my code. So I don't know what I did. Why didn't you see it? Um, but not to be deterred, she decides that she's going to fight this fire. And what she finds out is really interesting. Turns out, uh, in this very large pull request of like 20 some files, uh, she had added a controller. And turns out, somewhere along the line of rebasing, uh, she had two controllers, and one was empty and one was not. And the empty one was overriding the one with all the code, and the entire application has come crashing down. So by committing an, an empty file that no one noticed, she basically caused kind of a mess. So this gets her thinking. Uh-oh. We really thought that we had this code review process down. <laughs> no. Nope, 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 we don't. Because clearly, if we had it down perfectly, we wouldn't have had this problem occur. I wouldn't be fighting this fire. So she starts thinking, OK, there must be a better way of doing code reviews, right? Right? So Goldilocks, being the Ruby developer that she is, does what probably any of us would do. She does some research. And she asks the internet. And she reads about this ancient text called Code Complete, which uh, dates back to the old year of 1993. Uh, <laughs> it's a really great book. It's written by Steve McConnell. I highly recommend that you read it. Um, and in reading Code Complete, uh, she starts le learning about the theory and the history of code reviews and why we started doing them um, as teams and as an industry in the first place. And in Code Complete, uh, Steve McConnell talks about a lot of different like, research that he's done um, and the theory behind code reviews. And one of the things that he says is that code reviews, um, one part of managing a software engineering process is catching problems at the lowest value stage. That is, at the time at, we, at which the least investment has been made and the problems cost the least to correct. And basically, what he says is that code reviews are meant to act as quality gates. Just as we test and review the products that we build, code reviews are meant to do that for our code bases. But as she starts thinking about the teams that she's worked on, the two teams, she realizes that none of the code review processes that she's been a part of really feel like they're of good quality. They kind of just feel like formalities. So she keeps reading. And she learns about something called the idea of collective ownership of construction. And this is what code reviews are meant to center upon. This idea that if all of us have a hand and a stake in what we're building together, then our code will actually improve as a consequence. And Steve McConnell has done a lot of research, and he's found a lot of studies. Um, and he writes about this in Code Complete. 
and she learns about um, a few of the different benefits that code reviews actually give us on our engineering teams. One of those is that if you have multiple sets of eyes on a code base, you actually end up with better quality code. Seems obvious, but for those of us who might not do code reviews regularly, it actually is a huge factor. Another thing is that if someone leaves the team and you have a code review process that's formalized, it's a lot easier to pick up where they left off. If someone leaves the team and everybody's at least looked at the code in review, even if they've never worked with it before, it'll be a little bit easier for them to dig their teeth into it if they need to add a feature or fix a bug. Finally, another great benefit of having code reviews is that the process of detecting defects, the process of catching bugs, goes a lot faster if someone's at least seen the code before or reviewed it. If you've never seen a file ever and you're trying to find a bug in it, it's a lot tougher. So it turns out that in the late 80s, a time that I you know, can't really imagine anymore, but back then, uh, code reviews uh, came in three shapes and sizes. One was something called inspections, and this is actually something that was started by a guy named Michael Fagan at IBM. And basically what he did was he started this um, hour-long code review process where there would be three people, a reviewer, the author of the code, and a moderator. And they would basically sit down and they would focus on defect detection. They would focus on going through the code and looking for things that could potentially go wrong, basically trying to snag bugs. The important thing was that they were not correcting as they went along. And there was a great talk this morning about not fixing bugs while refactoring. To that same point, it's really good to not fix bugs um, while you're reviewing. Instead, keeping the review process as its own thing is really important, according to Steve McConnell's research. So, these really long code review processes called inspections um, took a little bit of upfront time and effort, but it turns out that they were actually really beneficial to the teams that use them. The three people, the reviewer, uh, the author of the code, and the moderator would come in with a checklist, and they would all know what they were looking for and what their roles were in the code review. And when IBM started implementing this, and when they shared it with other engineering teams, it turns out that before using inspections and after, 60% of defects in code uh, bases were caught. And there were 20 to 30% fewer defects per 1,000 lines of code after using inspections on teams. The most important part of what these code reviews used to be was that after a code review process, everybody on the team would sit down and basically talk about what went well and what didn't, and they would take that data and recycle it back, and they would iterate so that each time they did an inspection, it would get better with time. But not everybody has a thousand lines of code that they're adding to a code base. Sometimes you're adding only a few lines. This brings us to our second type of code review. This is something called short reviews. And um, the basic idea here was that a lot of teams weren't doing any type of code review process for um, one line changes or five line changes. And it turns out that based on research, those five line changes and one line changes are actually the ones that are the most painful and the most error prone. Teams that introduced short reviews found that they would go from a 55% error rate to just a 2% error rate. And those that didn't use short reviews and then implemented them found that they had an 86% correctness rate before having short reviews, and then afterwards, they had a 99.6% correctness rate. So that's the second type of code review. The third type is one that Goldilocks seemed kind of familiar with, and this was called something called a walkthrough. And this is effectively a type of working meeting where 
um, for 30 to 60 minutes, you have two engineers, usually a, a more junior engineer and a more senior engineer, and they talk about um, the code that's being submitted for review and technical choices and details that have been made and how to make them better. This was not nearly as effective. It is helpful, but not nearly as impactful as a formalized kind of code review. Teams that used walkthroughs found that they could catch approximately 30% of errors in a program, which is fine, but not the most effective. And the idea with walkthroughs is that they're a great learning opportunity for uh, junior engineers to ask questions of senior engineers and for them to also give uh, pushback against ideas and kind of like propel the team forward. Goldilocks also stumbled upon something called um, the peer review sophistication scale. And she kind of looked at this and started thinking about whether any of the code reviews that she had been a part of were actually of any good. Were they even valuable? And as she thought about this and looked at the scale, she realized that most of the teams she's worked on, she probably fell at number two maybe a number three. And she got a little bit worried, and she wondered, am I the only one that feels this way? Does anybody else feel like this too? And this is all theory, but like in practice, what are other teams doing? Do any of us have this code review thing down? So she decided to debug this whole idea of code reviews in the industry today. And because Goldilocks is a modern-day Ruby developer, she did what any of us would do. She asked Twitter. I don't know if this was you know, the best decision for her, but she did it anyways, because um, we know all good things come from Twitter. Um, and she basically created a survey and asked all the developers that she knew to spend a couple minutes and answer a couple of questions about what their code review processes were like and whether they were happy with them at all or not. So a little disclaimer, Goldilocks is definitely not a data scientist, so she probably could have done a better job um, of collecting data and analyzing it. But it's a start. Um, one of the ways that this data is a little bit limited is that it's obviously going to only be people who answered the survey, so it's not a great representation of all developers, but it's something that we can use at least. So the first thing that she learned is that the majority of people answering her survey, survey worked in uh, Java. I don't know why. Um, they also used Ruby and Rails and JavaScript. Um, and there were some other languages as well, but for the most part, that was the majority of people who were answering the survey, so something to keep in mind. And she found that the majority of people who responded did feel like code reviews made them better developers. So they seemed to be on the same page as her, that code reviews were overall a good thing. Okay, cool. We all seem to be on the same page. What else can we agree upon? Well, it seemed like Swift developers found code reviews to be the most beneficial. They came in at about a 9.5 on a scale of 1 to 10. And Ruby developers came in second, so not bad, 9.2. Um, so everybody seemed to think that code reviews were helping their teams. What was interesting was that while most people did have all their pull requests reviewed for their teams, there was still a whole 10% of people who had to ask for review. 10% of respondents didn't have any type of formalized code review process. They had to ask for it, which made her feel a little bit better because she had been in that position before too. What was even more interesting was that it didn't really matter what framework you worked with or what language. Some teams seemed to have a formalized code review process down, and others just didn't, which led Goldilocks to believe that it, whether you have a code review process that works has nothing to do with what language you use or what framework, and everything to do with the people on your teams. 
Another interesting thing that she found was that, like her startup, most teams only needed one person to review. A few people needed more reviewers, but generally one reviewer seemed to be enough. However, those reviewers would spend only five to 20 minutes doing um, a review of a pull request. And there were some people who, um, who had to wait um, up to a day or even a few days to receive review from their teammates. So as she read through some of the responses in her survey, she saw that a lot of people were doing code reviews, but not all of them were happy with how they were being conducted. And she kind of boiled it down to two aspects. The two things that made, made or broke a code review were time and substance. Um, one person wrote into her survey and they said, we have one developer who blindly thumbs up every PR and rarely leaves comments. They're attempting to game the rule of at least two approvals. It's easy to tell because inside of one minute, they've approved three pull requests. Someone else wrote in and they said, if, the second, if there's a second and third reviewer, they are more likely to just rubber stamp after seeing the first person's review. So Goldilocks started wondering, are we just going through the actions of reviewing each other's code? Like, are we considering time and substance? Because it seems like a lot of us are unhappy with this. So let's figure out what we mean when we say time and substance. The amount of energy and the amount of time that you spend on a code review turns out to be pretty significant in how happy engineers are with the code review process. So what we mean by this is who's doing the review and how much time are they spending on it? Because that seems to really make a difference. It's not just the act of doing the code review. It's how much weight they carry and who's actually doing the work. Someone wrote into her survey and they said, everyone on the team should receive equal review. I feel like it's so common for senior people to get no feedback because people assume that they can do no wrong. They totally can. And they might want feedback. Junior people get nitpicked to death and people seem to forget that self-esteem can be easily affected and that when someone's submitting a code review, they're being vulnerable. Another person wrote in to her survey and said that code reviews need to be acknowledged as a first-class citizen. They are a legitimate activity that needs time and focus. And as she read through these responses, she noticed that there were a couple common themes that kept popping up. Developers seemed to be really frustrated by code reviews that had very large commits or really long PRs and those that provided no context. It meant that you would have to spend more energy and time on the code review and that seemed to be a huge barrier. It was also very frustrating for developers when different people were spending different amounts of time reviewing, particularly when junior developers would get more criticism and longer reviews and senior developers wouldn't. And another point of frustration was when technical leads or upper management or CTOs would basically prevent you from, um, as a team, treating code reviews as first class citizens. When code reviews were downvalued, developers felt more frustrated by their team's overall process and productivity. So what about substance? Well, as it turns out, even if everyone reviews and is reviewed, what they're saying and doing while reviewing is pretty important. So when we say substance, what we're really talking about 
is how a code review occurs. Um, so Goldilocks did a, like a find and file in all of her responses, and she found that 5% of people just automatically had a negative reaction with the phrase code review, uh, and they, were, they basically used the term nitpick. Like, I hate code reviews, they're so nitpicky, they're terrible. And that was like 5% of her respondents, just automatically, which really spoke volumes about how people feel about code reviews and what they actually are doing to the team's morale. So as it turns out, there are a couple things that seem to be points of frustrations and points of frustration for what a code review consists of. People really did not like tons and tons of comments on their pull requests. They would much rather have a conversation about it. They also seem to be really frustrated by having conversations about style um, and syntax, um, and that seemed to be an indicator of a negative code review process. They did, however, like having uh, conversations about content and semantics. Those seem to be indicators of a more positive code review process. The biggest one, however, was people who had um, empathetic code reviews generally seemed to be happier with their workflows, whereas people who had experiences with very egotistical reviewers or submitters of code reviews um, were more frustrated um, by the entire process and thought of it in a very negative light. One person wrote into her survey and said that you should review the code, not the person. Let tools handle styling changes for you so that you don't have to spend time with this as a team. Another person wrote in and said, if I ever find myself going back and forth on something via comments, I'll just ping the other person and ask them to pair. Sometimes it's just a lot easier to talk to someone. Another person wrote in and said that on their team, there was trolling of code. And they didn't even have any kind of code of conduct, so it was really hard to stop this. And this was both disheartening, but also kind of uplifting for Goldilocks, because she realized that she was not the only person that has, had gone through this. She was not the only person who had been disappointed by code reviews in the past. And in reading through her survey responses, she realized that one of the major factors of what had changed between 25 years ago, when Steve McConnell wrote Code Complete and talked about the theory of code reviews, and engineering teams today was that a lot of teams didn't have any concept of a checklist of what a code review should or shouldn't be. And even worse, they had stopped collecting data and iterating on their code review processes. People had stopped talking about it and people had stopped thinking about whether it was actually effective. They were just going through the motions of doing them. So, I told you that this was a fairy tale, um, and we've been going along this journey with Goldilocks, but I have been not entirely truthful with you, because as it turns out, this is not a fairy tale. I'm Goldilocks. Oh my God. Surprise! Oh, I know. <laughs> Plot twist, I know. Nobody saw that coming. So, um, these days, I don't actually work at either of those two companies. Um, I work at a company called Tilda in Portland, Oregon, um, and we build uh, something called Skylight, which is your favorite Rails profiler. If you need something to profile your Rails application, you should check us out. Um, and to be totally honest with you, I don't even know if we're doing code reviews right. But what I do know is this. We have a lot of conversations about them. And every engineer on our team feels like they can talk to the rest of the team and bring up issues or points of frustration if they have them. One of my coworkers actually, she submitted an RFC to totally change our code review process. And that RFC was reviewed many times uh, with a lot of comments. Uh, but it, we decided to adopt it. And that's now um, the process that we use as a team. So I can feel like, um, I can bring up any issues to the rest of my um, 
colleagues, and we can talk about them, talk about them, and iterate and change them. So, based on all of this research that I've done and all of the people that I've talked to and the survey, I wanted to share with you a couple of things that you can do, small and big, to change your code review processes if you're not happy with them. Because clearly, as an industry, we all have some work to do on this. So a couple of small wins that you could implement when you leave here today. Commit hooks are really awesome. They basically make sure that you can run whatever tasks you need to before you push anything to GitHub. They'll make your life a lot easier. Um, I recommend trying them out. GitHub also has uh, an amazing feature called um, templates. And we use this at um, Tilda, where basically when somebody opens a pull, re uh, pull request, this template shows up and it has like a checklist of things you need to do before you can submit a pull request, things you need to do before you can ship. Um, and it's really great because people can immediately look at it and know whether something needs to work still or if something's ready to be reviewed. Another thing that's super, super helpful for your teammates, especially if you have a large team or you have people who um, might be more comfortable with certain parts of the code base, is giving them context. Giving your teammates context makes it a lot easier for them to target their efforts. And Don gave a great talk today about how human beings have like a certain capacity to focus and hold things in memory. This is gonna make it a lot easier for your teammates to be able to focus on what changes you made. It's really helpful to like add a GIF or a screenshot and show them like what is the thing that happened before the pull request and what can you expect to happen after? It'll make the process a lot easier and will probably put people in a much better mood. Linters, use them. We don't need to talk about like syntax and stuff. Like those are conversations that we don't need to have because we have machines to automate those things for us. So definitely use them and implement them. Tiny win, but really, really impactful. And lastly, encapsulate everything. Whether that means working on writing concise commits or creating small pull requests that are short and fixing things um, in a really, really concise and compact way. Encapsulate things so that nobody's reading hundreds of lines of code and feeling overwhelmed and just giving it a thumbs up and moving on. Because that's going to come back to haunt us later. Some teams have also found that it's really helpful to assign specific reviewers, particularly if you find yourself like waiting for someone to review a long time. Um, it's also really great because you can make sure that senior developers are reviewing um, and being reviewed, and that junior developers also get a chance to look at code um, that a senior developer might be working on and ask questions and learn about things that maybe they might not be familiar with yet. There are some big wins that you can do. They might look a little daunting, but I promise you the payoff is super worth it. First, pushing for a culture that values vulnerability. And I think one of the best ways to do this is by making sure that everyone puts themselves out there. Senior developers can make mistakes. I'm gonna say it again. Senior developers can make mistakes, and it's important for junior developers to see that and to be able to ask questions. When we're working in teams that are vulnerable enough to acknowledge that, we all become better developers and create a better product at the end of the day. <laughs> Develop empathy. This is harder to do, but you can do tiny things to make sure that your teammates are becoming more empathetic engineers and people. Um, one of the ways that I really like to do this is by calling out the things that I see um, another developer doing really well. So if there's a method that's named really beautifully, um, or some sort of abstraction or um, something that's been meta-programmed, I really like to call that out and say that, you know, you did a great job, that was awesome. That's so important because code reviews don't need to necessarily be something that's negative and, you know, a symbol of criticism. We have this collective ownership here in what we're building. So when someone does really well, that's all our victory in that too. And finally, Iterate. If you remember nothing else from today, 
it, this is so important, I'll say it again, iterate. And what I mean by this is start the conversation if you feel like your code review process isn't where you'd like it to be. And if you feel like there's room for improvement, or if you're really happy with it, share it with other people. Um, this, someone wrote into the survey, and I think they, they highlight this way better than I could, ever could. It's a really eloquent quote, and I'm not nearly as eloquent. Um, they said, I love code reviews in theory. In practice, they are only as good as the group that's responsible for conducting them in the right manner. Really, it's on all of us at the end of the day to make sure that our quality gates are of good quality. So if any of this data was interesting to you, I promise I'm not a data scientist, but I really tried. Um, you can find all of it at this website, bettercode.reviews. There were a lot of people who wrote in to the survey, and they have some really amazing um, thoughts on what makes a good code review and what doesn't. Unfortunately, it's way more than I could fit into 30 minutes, um, but you can find it all there, and you can take the survey yourself and tell me your thoughts on code reviews. I would love to hear them. Um, and that's all I have for you. Thank you so much. All right. Would anyone like to ask Goldilocks a question? <laughs> anyone? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the talk. I really appreciate the uh, research you put into it. It's, it's definitely awesome. So my company doesn't have a code review process, but we do do pair programming like the majority of the time. And that seems to address some of, or at least attempt to address some of the, um, uh, some of the quality issues that you wanted to bring into code reviews and like communication, in-person communication. Um, so does Goldilocks have an opinion on pair programming? Uh, she loves it. Uh I, I don't think I can do the rest of this question in third person. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm a really big fan of pair programming. We do pair programming at Tilda. Um, so we're always working with pairs and switching them up. But I think what's really nice about it, um, uh, well, what's really nice about having a code review process, even if you do have pair programming, is that when someone, for example, if I'm working with my pair on a feature and someone else is working on another part of the code base, it's nice for them to be in tune with what changes are happening um, in a different part of the code, even if you know, it's like at the end when they're submitting you know, a feature PR or something like that. Um, because things get merged into the code base all the time, and it can just kind of go as like a stream of things on a Slack channel, and you don't know what's happening. Um, so I would still really encourage some kind of code review process. It doesn't necessarily need to be like an hour-long inspection or something, but I think it's really beneficial to see what's going on in the code. And sometimes like, you might even have um, some context to provide on what you're working on and be like, maybe we should name this method slightly differently. We did something. Me and my pair did something over here. You might want to like, check it out, and it might be beneficial to the two of you on what you're doing. So I still think that code reviews can be super beneficial, but it might look different if you were working in pairs. Great question. OK, I saw a lot of hands, so I'm going to choose one. <laughs> yeah. So I have a two-part question. The first one is, and it's a direct follow-on to that, what does Goldilocks think about bear programming? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> OK, no opinion. Um, <laughs> or maybe you're just not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> so the next one is, so what does your ideal checklist look like? Or what's your good checklist to go through? Because this would be useful for me. Um, so like, what do I look for in a code review, basically, right? What's your, what's your list? Yeah. Um, I feel like I should probably write this down. This is a good question. Um, for me, it's probably. Can I read the code um, and understand what's the problem trying to be solved? Um, if I looked at it again in six months, is it clear to me? Um, if we left, someone left the company and was, if there was a junior programmer looking at this, would they be able to understand like, our methods name clearly? Are things actually doing what they're doing? Um, and are there tests? That's a big one. Thank you. Cool. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. 
Hi, thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Have you thought about uh, automate the small wins for core review? Sorry, can you repeat the <coughs> question one more time? Uh, have you thought about automate the small wins for core review? I haven't. I haven't automated all of those things. Um, I know people who have. I haven't personally been part of that. I have. I like implemented Rubocop at my last company, um, but I know other people who have. Like, I think the most automation we have is like the PR templates and like having linters to enforce style, um, things like that. Oh, nice. Because I know one tool is called <laughs> Dangerous System that can help automate code review. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, here. So, Hi. first of all, uh, it's great talk. Um, I'd like to share about our company. It's a, I think it's uh, better than the average code review, but it's not perfect. So, because um, the checklist that we're looking is, um, if, if the, even if it's a bug fix, sometimes um, if there's no test, we'll ask, where's the test, something like that. And yeah, uh, like you said, screenshots and, um, maybe how to re how to test the feature and all that and uh, i think it the the code review process also depends on the people and i think in our team we ha we have our egos in check so we don't really get affected by the criticisms and but the problem that we are encountering is that um, for bigger features of course many people do review but mm -hmm. when it comes to the merging part, no one wants to press the merge button. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, no one wants to be responsible for if something breaks. So, uh, mm. because you mentioned about collective ownership, yeah. so how do you think we can solve that problem? Um, so, I'll tell you one thing that we do at my company um, that has really helped mitigate this, which is that, again, we pair. Uh, so. One of the things I love about that um, is that you really displace this concept of blame, that it's not one person who wrote, a, you know, wrote something that had, they didn't write buggy code or something, or they didn't you know, break everything or bring down production. Like, there are other people who were involved in it too, and it's, coding is not something you do in a silo. And I think trying to create a team, whether that means like, um, having people work on one feature and break it into pieces, um, and take it apart and like you work on this and I'll work on that or pairing on some tougher parts like if there's part of it, the system that's more complicated having someone to work with work with you through that is really helpful but on a bigger level it means that it's never just like your fault and I think is this something that speaks to something larger in the industry where this idea of placing blame and fault and like you broke everything and brought down production like that's that's never going to help the person or the team um, and I think it ties into this idea of like to create a more empathetic team, you need to like change the language you use in code reviews, you need to change the idea that you know, it's all your fault and it's all just on you, whereas, as you said, collective ownership, um, having everybody have a stake in it and have a hand in it. Um, but that's a really great question. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Um, but that's a really hard thing to do because it depends on your team a lot. Okay, so uh, one thing that we do when that happens sometimes is we just ping those people on Slack and talk it, about it collectively. Yeah. But yeah, even if you don't really blame people, sometimes it's just a personal you know, mindset that maybe I'll break this, maybe they'll blame me, even if they will not. So I think it's a psychological problem as well. So. Yeah, I think changing those things are harder to do. Um, and developing empathy is not an easy thing, but you can take tiny steps towards it. Um, but it, it takes, it's a harder, it, that's why it's like a big win, not a small win, because it takes a longer time to do that. Okay. Uh, I think we only have time for one more question, so let's play a game of fastest hands up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all the hands down, okay, all the hands up first, so I know where to look. Uh, can I get, who, who wants to ask? One, two, three. Was there anyone else? Because just the three of you? Okay. Hands down. When I say three, the hands come up again. Okay, one, two, three. You cheated, <laughs> so it's you. Uh, so things like 
taking the time to do a thoughtful and empathetic code review and also taking the time to really contextualize the PR for the reviewer, um, those take time. Mm -hmm. um, what are some techniques you think that, tech, that teams can use to maintain momentum when they're pausing to put so much effort into empathy and documentation? That's a good question. Oof, that was a hard one. Um, Sorry. No, <laughs> no it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, so I guess your question is like, in making time to do code reviews, how do you still make sure that you're productive? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, to be honest, I think a large part of it is making code review um, as a, like submitting the review and doing the work of reviewing needs to be part of productivity because if you can do a better code review um, and avoid like eight hours of dev time debugging something, that is productivity. It's like preemptive, right? Um, so part of that is like changing maybe upper management or the tech leads um, concept and kind of like selling them and making them a stakeholder and why code reviews are important. Um, but I think another thing that really helps is by breaking it down into small, small uh, pull requests and commits. You make it easier. like the barrier for entry of how to get through reviewing is easier. Because um, then you're not like, oh, I have this 100 line or you know, 20 files thing to review. I'll just save it for like 4.30 PM because I don't want to do it because I have my own work to do. But if you make it a smaller thing that's more easy to digest, it's something that you know, if you ping someone, they can find some time the next hour, hopefully, to do it. Like Making it um, more bite-sized, I think, is another good way to make that um, a bit more approachable and not something that slows you down as a team. But I'm, I'm sure there are more ways, but I have to think more on how to answer that question, but it's very good, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's give it up for Vaidehi. Thank you very much.